happening tonight in Vancouver. We have no plans, none, to change our requirements around self-isolation in BC. BC has no plans to follow in Alberta's footsteps, removing COVID measures like isolating when ill or contact tracing, and diplomatic about what changes there could mean here. And then we got up at 4 a.m. We got here, we've been here since out in the parking lot since 4.30. They're lucky if they get on board at all. That's what travelers here at Tawasin Terminal are saying as they try to get away for the long weekend. Delta is a formidable foe. Delta as contagious as the chicken pox, the alarming new CDC report, why it says the war against COVID has changed. This is City News Everywhere. BC is holding course with the response to COVID-19 as other provinces like Alberta are starting to make substantial changes to their health response. We have no plans, none, to change our requirements around self-isolation in BC. We have no plans, none, to change our approach to contact tracing. In Health Minister Adrian Dix not making comment or casting judgment on Alberta's decision to make drastic changes, including removing isolation requirements mid-August, even if you have COVID, and a few weeks later ending testing outside of high-risk and acute care settings. But he's clear BC will continue the backbone of the public health response here, like quarantining when COVID positive. We need to obviously contract trace and work with the, the broader community of people around them and also help them uh, during what can be a very stressful and, of course, uh, for many people, a period when people get extremely sick. As for what the changes there will mean here, he's diplomatic and non-committal, but reiterating vaccinations are key to protection. And they're busting out all the stops for shots, like getting immunized waiting for a ferry. People who are ferry passengers, whether they're waiting in their vehicles or foot passengers waiting to hop on the ferry, can first hop on our mobile vaccine bus, get their shot, whether it's the first or second dose, and then be on their way. And while there are clearly a lot of people heading to the island and cases have been high there, it's vaccinations, the workhorse of BC's response, not travel that concerns him. We've had cases in the last few days on Vancouver Island. We're going to continue to have some cases on Vancouver Island. And that means it's as important on Vancouver Island as anywhere to get immunized against COVID-19. Getting shots in people under 50 especially key. The Kelowna area outbreak mostly unvaccinated 20 to 40 year olds. Dick's confident relying on the approach BC's followed throughout will prevail there and throughout the province. But warning people to brace for cases to remain high for a while longer, even with the regional mask mandate and travel advisory brought in there this week. It's going to take some time for those, uh, those uh, changes to have an effect on new cases. So we may or may not see anything anywhere on Tuesday morning in any event. It won't be because of uh, travel on the weekend. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yuzda. Well, daily COVID-19 cases are still on the rise as BC records another 243 in the past day, and that is the highest since the end of May. More than half of these new cases are people who live in the Interior Health Region, followed by Fraser Health. There were no new COVID-related deaths in the past 24 hours. I firmly uh, believe that quarantine and isolation can help prevent the spread. Canada's top doctor dances delicately around Alberta, cutting back on COVID measures as modeling shows the start of a fourth wave. Well, despite everything we've been hit with this summer, we've at least had clear, relatively smoke-free skies. But, yeah, that's about to change. The forecast is for wildfire smoke from the interior and the U.S. to close in on the south coast, starting after midnight tonight. It will get increasingly hazy through tomorrow and into Sunday for Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. The smoke will work its way over to Vancouver Island and into Sea to Sky Country as well. We're waiting. So. Do you feel lucky then that you're even going to get on? <laughs> yes. It's jam-packed here at Tawasin Terminal where people are waiting hours upon hours in hot lineups to try to get away to Vancouver Island for the long weekend. It's been really crazy. My husband and I woke up at 3.30 in the morning to get here to catch the 5.15 sailing. We didn't make that. 
We also didn't make the 745, and now we're hoping to make the 1030 sailing. Traffic is bumper to bumper getting into the terminal. Once inside, the lineups are long and the temperatures are grueling. Passengers hoping to drive onto a ferry Friday without a reservation had a lot of regrets. Some waited upwards of six to seven hours to get on board. Well, we got here at eight o'clock last night. No go. We went and got a hotel room. That was another joy. Then we got up at 4 a.m. We got here and we've been here since out in the parking lot since 4.30. Being stuck waiting here, it, it, this is stupid. One traveler we spoke with had a reservation, but when he arrived at the terminal, he says he was denied because he didn't book a spot specifically for an oversized vehicle. So now he and his family will also have to wait. And because of a formality, we didn't get on. And uh, because of that, they're like, oh, you're on the 1245 still. We'll try and push you in. They didn't make it, so. We had this book like six months ago. BC Day Long Weekend is traditionally the busiest weekend of the year for BC Ferries, and it's certainly shaping up to be that way. Uh, we did see multiple sailing waits yesterday for customers uh, that didn't have reservations. We're seeing that again today. Your best bet, according to BC Ferries, is to try and travel Saturday night or Sunday morning if you don't have a vehicle reservation for the weekend. For those opting to go to the island by air rather than water, well, it's tough in the sky as well. Harbor Air is completely booked up Friday and Monday. For those here at Tawasin Terminal, many travelers are just trying to keep cool and make the best out of a less than ideal situation. We have most of our hobbies kind of with us anyway because we were on vacation, so just hang out and spend the time however we can. In Tawasin, Ashley Burr, City News. Stanley Park is closing overnight to help prevent the risk of brush fires. Starting tonight, the park will be closed from 10 o'clock until 6 o'clock in the morning because of the chance of a fire breaking overnight when fewer people may notice it. Bus routes that go through the park will still be allowed, but the seawall will be closed and park rangers will be on hand to remove people. YVR is getting $38 million from Ottawa to improve its drainage system and extend its end of runway safety area. The money is part of the federal government's previously announced airport critical infrastructure program. The federal transport minister says the projects will help make sure the airport is protected from rising seawaters and storms. Cases and deaths from COVID-19 have continued to climb. Much of this increase is being driven by the highly transmissible Delta variant. That update from the WHO Friday after an alarming CDC report surfaced saying the war against COVID has changed as scientists learn more about Delta's dire threat. The coronavirus variant known as Delta that's surging around the globe appears to cause more severe disease according to an internal document from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, based on unpublished data first reported by the Washington Post. That shows fully vaccinated people might spread the variant at the same rate as unvaccinated people, and that it spreads as easily as chickenpox, a variant so contagious that it acts almost like a different novel virus, leaping from target to target more swiftly than Ebola, or the common cold. And according to the Post, CDC scientists were so alarmed by the new research that the agency earlier this week significantly changed guidance for vaccinated people, urging them to wear masks in hot spots. Based on the Delta development, officials must acknowledge the war has changed in the fight against COVID. But the internal report is said to underline that vaccination provides significant protection against the virus as CNN reports, reducing the risk of severe disease or death tenfold. We've heard about uh, some of the findings. Reaction here at home Friday to the reported CDC research. Delta is a formidable foe, is the most transmissible variant. And I believe that data is going to show that um, it may be even more transmissible than we originally thought. And that makes sticking to health measures like masking and physical distancing even more critical says Canada's chief public health officer. And get vaccinated. Melissa Duggan, City News. If uh, the policy in Alberta is 
is not to mandate that, then I would ask that any individual who is diagnosed with COVID-19 or you think you may have it, um, please isolate, please get your test um, and um, inform your close contacts. Alberta will soon no longer require testing, contact tracing or self-isolation for COVID patients, but Dr. Teresa Tam is asking Albertans to do all that themselves if the province won't. Despite this, Dr. Tam says she won't tell any province how to manage the pandemic. This as new public health modeling shows Canada on the cusp of a new Delta-driven fourth wave. Exponential growth follows this pattern that we don't seem to be able to get wrap our heads around what looks like very slow or no growth for quite some time, that flat portion of the curve, and then a sudden uptick. It's unfortunate that we don't start talking about waves until we're into the sharp upward swing. By then, it's too late to do anything about it. Public Health's fourth wave model makes a few assumptions. First, that Delta is 50% more transmissible than the Alpha variant first seen in the UK. That figure is backed up by a British government paper. The long-range forecast also assumes two doses of the vaccine are about 80% effective at preventing Delta. In this model, if Canadians increase contacts by just 25%, we go onto this steep blue upward curve with a higher peak than the third wave. Colin Furness says public health's lateness to acknowledge aerosol transmission was critical to the start of this new wave. The day that we decided, and wherever it was, in whichever province, uh, July 16th in Ontario, the day we decided that it was okay for people to be indoors, unvaccinated, sharing air without a mask, that was the first day of the fourth wave right there. Neither Tam nor her deputy, Dr. Howard New, explicitly said they disagreed with decisions by Alberta, Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan to start phasing out COVID measures like testing and isolation. But Tam emphasized Canada is already in the fight against Delta and it's more critical than ever to vaccinate as many people as possible. I mean, just a reality check that Delta is going to be in every direction. And in addition to any kind of concerns about domestic travel, it's really Delta can be anywhere in Canada. So um, it's not just about domestic travel or, or spread. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. It's another case of girl power at the games. We have a silver medal. Just got it. Kylie Moss, Canada. Go, Canada, go. Uh, we will have the latest on that win for you uh, at our 11 o'clock broadcast. Twin sisters Jordan and Kyla Bear are getting set to play Division I hockey at the Rochester Institute of Technology this fall. The 17-year-olds from the Oshapaway's First Nations say they have very big dreams but will never forget where they came from. Kyla and Jordan, how did you get into playing hockey? I mean, I know you're twins. You guys are all synced up. But did one have an interest in it and the other followed? Our parents put us into hockey when we were four. So our older, two older brothers were on the ice while we were just beginning and pushing around chairs. And they always zoomed past us. So I guess we just always wanted to keep up with our older brother. You guys had to leave your family to come out to BC and pursue your dreams of playing hockey at such a high level. What was the hardest part about that and how did you guys overcome it? The hardest part was just becoming homesick. Like for me, I kind of, I wasn't quite homesick just because we were always on the move and I always thought of it as like a very long hockey tournament. <laughs> it just kind of, it kind of eased me into moving away that far at such a, at such a young age. Yeah, we moved away in um, grade nine to Melville, Saskatchewan, where we are right now going into the arena a bit. So it was it was 45 minutes, but then we decided to make the move to BC in grade 11. Now, you two said you dream of playing in the Olympics. What would it mean for you and your family if you got that opportunity to represent your country as Indigenous athletes? Honestly, it would be like a one of our biggest accomplish accomplishments so far where we've become because we put time and effort so honestly it just be an accomplishment for what we've trained for i probably wouldn't even know what to say at that point i'd be speechless i want to talk a little bit more about being a role model i mean you're following your mentor do you two realize that you may be role models for other young girls in your community representation matters do you feel any added pressure with that on you? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, yes, there's a lot of young First Nations looking up to us. And I mean, people say there should be pressure, but 
I just think it's a big supporting group behind us and kids looking up to us, which is an accomplishment because that's what we've always wanted. Yeah, now the next step, you guys are headed to RIT. Celeste Brown, she's going to be in her first season as coach there. So how do you see Coach Brown helping you take your games to the next level? Honestly, she's so determined on making us one of the best teams in the league. And for us going there, that's what we want. I think she's bringing in a pretty good winning team this year. We have a lot of young freshmen who are personally, I think, pretty good. And she just has this like winning mindset. And now you also have connected with the youth in your community uh, by coaching some of uh, some on ice skill sessions. Are you continuing to do that? And um, how's that been going? Um, yeah, we have been con- uh, continuing to do that. Like we we've had so much given to us when we were younger. In grade 11, we um, did a free skate with all the kids after school. But then as grade 12 came around and COVID was such a big thing, we kind of like toned it down just a little bit just to keep everyone safe. But as we get a, our one year of RIT underneath our belt, we'll, belt, we will for sure continue to give back to the community. Turns out Kyla and Jordan aren't going to be the only set of twins playing for the RIT Tigers. They'll be joining Annie and Jesse Burks from Idaho. So one day we could see two sets of twins battling each other as the U.S. battles Canada in the Olympics. For City News, I'm Sportsnet 650's Caroline Frolic. This week in science, we're at our friendly neighborhood power substation talking about super polluters. Now, right now, the most emitted greenhouse gas in the world is carbon dioxide, and the biggest human source of that gas is the burning of fossil fuels for electricity. But not all power plants pollute the same. Some researchers at the University of Colorado Boulder set out to find the worst of the worst, as in which of the world's power plants put out the most CO2 each year. They combed through an inventory of over 29,000 facilities across almost every nation on the planet and came up with a top 10 list of super polluters. Not surprisingly, they're all powered by coal. Two are in India, six are in East Asia, and the other two are in Europe, including the Buhatu power station in Poland, which is right at the top of the list. Now, just two of these locations put out more carbon pollution per year than the entire country of Switzerland. And the researchers also found that nearly three quarters of all emissions from power generation come from just 5% of the world's power plants. That is a very stark inequality, and it tracks if you narrow in on specific nations like the U.S., South Korea, and Japan. But if that 5% were to make some changes, we could put a serious dent in electricity-based CO2 emissions. If they all switched from oil and coal to natural gas, for example, those emissions would drop an estimated 30%. If they all installed carbon capture and storage systems, they'd be cut nearly in half. The good news coming out of this data is how narrow of a target it paints. Now, a lot of proposed solutions to the climate crisis involve making sweeping changes that can seem impossible to achieve fast enough. But cracking down on super polluters might take a nation by nation approach, but it's a relatively simple way to start addressing a global crisis. With This Week in Science on City News, I'm News 1130's Curtis Doring. All right, so in case you missed it, we have another medal at the Games. Silver for Team Canada, Kylie Moss winning in the 200-meter backstroke. We'll have all the details later this evening. By the way, your next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Hope to see you then. Have a great night.